coming and thank you for being there. It is a delight to have so many of you online. And of course, all of you here as well. Uh, I'm Peter, I'm the events coordinator here at City Lights and I'd like to welcome you. As always, we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ohlone peoples. I'd like to take this moment just to kind of acknowledge those who have come before us as stewards of the land. Uh, to have Gillian with us always is a delight. And then finally, again, in the poetry room of all places, which after many, many moons, you know, Gillian is no stranger to City Lights. We have hosted her many times before. She has actually hosted me. I mean, it, she's also translated the Henri Michaud, A Thousand Times Broken that City Lights published, uh, a very dear, dear friend. And so happy to be celebrating a new book of poetry, Notes from the Passenger, which is published by the wonderful Night Boat Books. Uh, this is Gillian's ninth collection, if you can believe that. So probably some of her most intimate work to date, its poems traversing territories at once mythic and yet engaging in this very perilous world that we live in. Uh, there's a world wrought with both beauty and oftentimes great violence, and Gillian embraces it whilst also looking beyond it towards more infinite dimensions, never really shying away from the unknown or the unknowable. Um, she is a true traveler in words as well as in emotion, and it is really breathtaking and a delight to go along with her for the ride in this wonderful new collection. So Notes from the Passenger offers us food for the soul, and it is a pleasure to be able to host Gillian again here with you in the Poetry Room. So joining her tonight is Norma Cole, who is a great poet, translator, educator in her own right. Also, City Lights published Where Shadows Will, which was the inaugural volume in the Spotlight Poetry Series. Uh, Norma has a longstanding relationship with the world of letters here in San Francisco, being a member of the Circle of Poets around Robert Duncan and being involved with language poets and so on. She's had wonderful translations. She did Emmanuel Hacquard and uh, Fuad Gabriel Nafa. She has taught at USF at San Francisco State. Really such an honor and a delight to always have her in our presence. So I'm going to get things started by turning it over to Gillian, who will read from her new book. Welcome. Okay, thank you, Peter. That's a really wonderful introduction. Thanks. Oh, I'm seeing everyone that came. Thanks for coming out. And thanks for the people that are online, too. Um, let's see. I'm going to... That's better, yeah. Okay. <laughs> It's real, every time I come into the poetry room, I, I feel my pulse quicken uh, because of where we are. And um, I want to thank Peter for not only being the events coordinator for City Lights, but also he's such a great independent scholar that has done amazing programs on Walter Benjamin and the Dada festival and that's like we could go on with all of the things that Peter has brought to us and continues to do so so thank you very much Peter for all of that work yeah and uh thank you Nightboat Books for publishing this book and thank everyone for coming and I will I was going to say I'll be quiet now and read but I will do that um, the, this book is really new and I haven't really learned how to read from it yet. Um, but what, I, I'm getting used to the microphone. What I have, um, when I have read from it, it seems like the starting at the beginning and reading, um, for quite a while through that. And I'm, so I'm probably going to, I'm going to do that. And if there's time, I might leap forward in the book a little bit and I'll redact. I can't read the entire poem of St. Perpetua, but I'll read, I hope to read part of it. Um, okay. The Passenger. Are my peas really puffing into the microphone or not? They're good. Okay, thank you. All right. No, no criticism. <laughs> Okay. The peas are what? <laughs> the peas are good. Okay. The passenger. 
once and for all mind wanderings of the passenger, the beer garden's composure in its death rattle, green partitions, scaled walls, backstroking waterways, lure to lure, the passenger rejects projection, its limpid mirror-like distortion, perverse vibratory qualities of the seat cushion, a spreading of the hands. The passenger walked without destination for years without aging in open sorrow, a suitcase out of which everything had fallen by the wayside bit by bit as though a salesperson without wear. Along sidewalks, discarded nurse caps, the gloves of queens, a demolition of the root in the deep microhizzel network between white bark pine and subalpine conifers, the passenger began to step and swerve in an unsteady manner. A hologram projected up against a hieroglyph, figure drawings in caves, indeterminate, exact, the sun going red, yellow, red, often never unearthed. The passenger finished off the memory drink with its supernova's hyper-relativistic speck. Sun still more than four billion years old, a glimpse, a glint into Homeric times when one could pick up one's chariot with one hand. Warm Dushan, open country. It was most like night, this thing we walked into. The messenger. The messenger came without papers and song, out of sleep unharmed, a guide figure at a pit stop, digestive issues, a tingling sore throat. At all times, the time between technologies dripped, a rain silver tinged, translucenced into day, pink blue shade of one unidentified flower bush. The messenger took a sprig, couldn't say, I am a messenger with epistolary anthropological epigenetic trauma. Some deep ancestral thing floats over the greening hills. Surely you understand this, the messenger said at a loss. The messenger had no distinguishing physical characteristics, but was more a feeling that all was going <clears throat> to be made clear. Necrotic silence in a shed, a peaceful death inside a bunker, an overheated RV rummed, holding screen in air. One could still breathe out of a twizzle stick. The messenger was part of the deep urge to sit, stand, lie down in an aura of intimacy awaiting the message, the charged surround data claims we open around 15 times a day awaiting the message. It does not matter what one secretes or imbibes, whether is a serotonin permafrost, a lickable flame. The messenger would sometimes appear stretched out before the monument, overgrown dragonflies iridescent at pears, flip mortality over the body, picking up pears, the body that is grounded by the planet. I have sent you a moonstone talisman via snail mail, says the messenger, attempting friendliness. Also, pain is everywhere. War never cleanses. In her silk coat pocket, the algorithm fibrillating, the messenger wanted an implant in the hand the size of a grain of rice to get shopping done, the blackout curtains drawn under a sun color of fresh salmon now frozen, some said a new seasoning of smoke and ash sprinkled over slices of mango would pretend the messenger was of temporary non-citizenship in an exclusive genderless, paradisical future universe, an orb where we take a car, an invaginated spermicide down pathways to an old belief system turned glassine on which on either side, we who were awaiting the message in an aura of intimacy peered, looking through, 
smitten by the mystery of one another, as if that were the message going all Cohen with a worn deck of red cards, a divining rod, whispering technology of a battery clock. I would love to begin to explain the many voices plugged in, wires dangling, a desire for windstorm. Starlings seem to hear themselves. It is pleasurable, reply the naturalists. I would love to begin to say something to relieve the onslaught of unleashed voices, but it appears <laughs> I have fallen down a sky blue tube in the aura of intimacy awaiting the message between birth and personhood, death's even song enters everyone you love, pierces gut, and everyone forgets very, very slowly pears flushed russet in trees, a quiver over history's ossuary of banality and greed, though roadside tumbles a child's silver bucket, handle still on the pail. Why day lilies, why thistle, why shoes, hats to carry departed death essence to those of us remaining among the longest living? We lost the baby, though the baby crowned. When we loved, we were crowned. The sorrows returned when our crowns, gems, thorns ruptured into our skulls. Bombs, bombs, dick pics, and bombs, the live takes of how to sweep cages of baby shit back onto ruling class. I would like to message you, but the white powdery appropriation of my throat, cuttlefish, songbird, vapor in this body is like a body politic or stringy cloud. Everyone a sage rising on a platform, a rapture, massaged into all of the threats, multi-glottal, the collective dream of art, how even in death or in birth, dust marks glint the perineum, a celestial orbit. The messenger presents the body with a very clean blood and the curse, a head full of Ouroboros for a wig if all hair falls out. In the middle of no more money, in orgasm, we give ourselves over to the briny substance just under the surface of the divine. Somewhere in love remains trust, in the melody, in the die off, in the clear, clear water the messenger is tracking, Daedalus, where the mysteries are contemplated, in the true ink and felt future public orphan of the word, sky blue. Clear sky blue. Okay. Uh, this poem is from my daughter, and it's called How It Was No Longer Only the Country That Was Divided. It was the order in their words so that when someone said work, we lay down, so that when someone said art, Memory was our insufficiency. We caught it in our hands, grievous sharp. After five or so years, the t-shirt pills. Every day, I say, try throwing it away to teach my daughter something new. Your grandfather's war helmet, I say. Your grandmother's high pile of cottony tresses, the opal axis of her hairpin, steel mink of her closed eye, something new. Who speaks through your mouth? Throw it away. Do you want it to say Sister Perpetua or Mother Apocalypse on your t-shirt? Tumbling out, a word order reveals a pack of boys who unzip to sire the city seepage. I say, if dust cosmological camouflage cuts us, we reroute to another street. I mean, who knows? The house might not even be here. You, however, are my wonder, fatal, prenatal, as water down a leg. I was born after a war, came of age in a war, leave war everywhere. Who speaks through your mouth won't be me. Something very large and open and waiting, waiting. I errand to fill my hole. You scroll 
and want worlds, the many worlds of wanting worlds. The gentle body of light enters the car, slow surfing the speed bumps, carrying us along oceanically. Because I am vanishing, I think to show you how, but not just now. Let's not talk just now. Return, return, says the body of light, deciding to not decide which one of us to call into gentle body of light's luscious quandary, settling also into the front seat, transmuted, inflamed, our faces, our voices. If as mother I gave you mortality, if as daughter you gave me immortality's brief mirror glint, you are reaching into screen to play your music. If this is the end, empty hands of humanity, will not tomorrow be enough for you? Mortality upon us with its rosy edge of want. Mortality upon us with a rosy edge of what? So nothing cannot go unsaid to pass the night in open air. Saint Perpetua invented the diary in prison. And after requesting water, knew not to ask for any other favor but perseverance of the flesh. I'm green and strong as live oak on dry gold grass. I'm blue with externalizing my interior enemies. When they are gone, I aspirate in primeval mist. James Joyce wrote the dead until the last page was snow full. If there is fire, we will pick it up, play with it. Gentle body of light, I am lonesome pine for you. Who speaks, waits under the blind glare of Jane Amers. <clears throat> Mysterious red rim, unlock and we river cane the lyric. You know that, Petois? Gentle body of light, you've got such a cruel ideal. Grievous sharp-nailed coyote steps at sea foam's edge. If we isolate the isotope, may it rain in the echo chamber. Gentle body of light, when we're within you, we're outside you. We swim the plasma. We wood shred the threshold. Find airport by matchlight. Okay. Thank you. All right, so I'll go to um, the St. Perpetua. There's a, a poem in the book that is, um, it's a longer poem that uh, explores the, um, the text of St. Perpetua's diary, which is only six pages long. And uh, it was... Um, she wrote uh, all of it until she was killed, until she was martyred. Uh, uh, she and her servant, rumored lover, Felicitas, um, were, they were led into an arena with cows that were to mutilate them, uh, but that didn't work, and then they were beheaded. And uh, Tertullian was her contemporary, and he is um, credited by some scholars. It's never been proven. Um, he claimed that he was an eyewitness, and he finished uh, what the rest of the of the um, the diary. Um, and I quote from it, and I I hate making these little things because it seems kind of like you're making fun of something. So when I, I hit a quote, I thought I would sort of do this. Okay. Uh, perpetuous, and, and I should tell you that I'm going to redact it because it's too long to read all the way through. And so when I do that, I'll let you know. Perpetuous diary. We were left no original, papyrus, vellum, no parchment. Though a redactor, soon after 203 CE, date of her martyrdom, is certain, she wrote in her own hand and from her own experience. 
Felicitas, Perpetua's Egyptian slave, servant, rumored lover, they are both described in prison with disheveled hair as though let loose like Latin subordinate clauses. I was languishing because I had seen languishing was one of Perpetua's phrases ferrying us through time soon before she receives a vision. A golden ladder of marvelous light, very narrow, only one person at a time could ascend, each side fixed with swords, lances, hooks, daggers. So if one slept, one's flesh <clears throat> would cleave to the iron. Her brother, among other Katashumans, pagans converted to Christianity but not yet baptized, was first to climb. He called back down, come Perpetua, but wait for the dragon's bite. So she calls on God who she was come to trust for help and slowly, not to scare, the dragon lifts his head to serve as the lowest rung on the ladder on which she steadies her first step. I trod upon his head to garden of immense extent. And four angels who left with no touch, a white-haired shepherd of a large statue who gave me cheese as though it were a little cake. I received it with folded hands and understood that it was to be a passion, not an escape, and ceased to have any hope in this world. Okay, so that's where I'm going to redact and move forward. So um, Perpetua has gone up the ladder. She doesn't receive the um, the indication from God that um, that she will be able to escape this situation, but rather that she it will be a passion that she will be crucified. And uh, this section I'm going to read to you now are contemporary creatures who are coming down the ladder. All ladders, columns of light, or tubes of the possible, who were left, we who were left no original, gather our resources, our tools, ink, solvents, resins, pigments, dyes, lubricants, dextrin, glycerin, fluorescent sediments, think to remain graphic, recorded, unredacted, alive or dead, or somewhere along the bardic vast night and head down, foot first, along the subatomic, nanos, and cosmos, thus to step carefully among the narrow hydroponic seedlings, recalibrate just what year it is when we become uninfectious, though diseased, uncured, like olive trees hundreds of years ago. Could Perpetua have remained in a state of suspension, cottoning on to a kind of life frequent with vision, one further rung, one further loop, quotidian is the diary. We understood it was to be a passion, collective yet separate running amid wild grasses in our pleasantly disrupted workflow along blued waters welcoming all sorts of bacteria back and lovingly attached. And given more time, more cells, what next would we render? Who would be our gods were it not the end, but the octave? Thank you very much. <laughs> it's nice here. Here goes the podium. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank For you. That reading was a such a wonderful reading. Oh my. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Norma, for, yeah. for being here and coming. And big, it means a lot to me. Big, big congratulations for the book. It's thrilling to see it, right? 
So as the interlocutor, yeah. To speak as close as you can. Okay. Our, they can't our, hear you. I have a lot of questions for you. Like, how do you play with language? Your blank spaces, the constellations around your diction, mm -hmm. you're working with other artists in other for art forms, your take on conceptual writing, materialism, imagination, the spirit, the lyric, and any other incidents, <laughs> anything you work, the books that feed you, that feed into your work. Too many questions. Let's start with one. Okay. 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 When, where do you place yourself literally and figuratively when you're writing? Where do I place myself yeah. literally and fig that's a literally and figuratively when I'm writing. Well, literally we could start with because that's easy, right? Um, all kinds of different places. Um, I have a, a, a studio that I write out of, but I'm all over the house. A and studio. That's what I do. And then figuratively, I really like that idea. I've never thought of that. And um, I think that one of the pleasures is um, that I make a, 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 a large sort of mess of, of language and um, sound, and I don't think at all about how it might come together and uh, something will catch and then uh, it's a process I very much enjoy so I think that the that figuratively um, it would be one of of a place of entering that that constellation of you know language and image and and just seeing what's there just grabs you mm -hmm. yeah yeah well um when you begin a new work um is there an awareness of your recent past work for instance peace or profane a halo or um that you're moving from there to here? Um, or is it more each time a start from scratch notion? Each okay. book has a different trajectory. Mm -hmm. So the divining rod, as you say in your poem, the messenger. Oh, the, the divining rod. Yeah. And the, if there's an awareness from, of, going from book yeah, to book yeah. and okay now no there is no awareness <laughs> oh, okay. yeah. well yeah. but you know you can't quit being yourself well yeah there's that problem but um after i finished the book i thought that it might be sort of related to profane halo that it uh -huh. that it had a and it dawned on me you know way after, after and even this is funny but even the even the cover of the book reminds me of profane halo but um ideologically the um uh, profane halo takes its title from uh giorgio agamben the italian philosopher and critic and his in particular his book the coming community and love that book so yeah that's one uh, yeah. that's just such a it's a great book and it was really influential to profane halo and this this book is very much concerned with the next i mean for a while the title the working title of the book was the next next world and so it has that um uh, uh, sense of itself being uh what is the next community since we failed so miserably at this one what is what what could that possibly be? 
So that I would say, but it was, I was not consciously at all doing that. Yeah. The, with this book, I was, I mean, it's the end of the world and the, the climate catastrophe and, you know, mass weaponry and all of everything that we've been living there, um, that the subject matter was so different from anything I'd ever written before. And the book has a sense of intimacy, personal intimacy in it, as well as this kind of implosion um, globally that um, I wasn't expecting it to have. But um, in that way, I see it as something really different from anything I've written. And you said the cover has some relationship with Profane Halo, but how did you um, get the cover? How, uh, how, how did what, that happen? Yeah. yeah. What, what I don't is your that, uh, the, relationship the, with the, this, William this cover? Kentridge? Yeah. Kentridge. Yeah. Yeah. It's, this is, it's a William it's Kentridge, so um, who's probably an artist that many of you are, are very familiar with and this is a um and as you, most of you know he worked in with charcoal and he would make films of of the charcoal drawings that he would make and then change those and then they would become new drawings and there were lots of layering that goes on in his work and um uh, i was working i would i was i was given a kind of assignment uh from a, the townsend um group at uc berkeley it's a it's a great it's a uh, it's a i hesitate to use the word think tank but that's a, it it's a um it's a group of scholars and i i was assigned a classical um scholar uh that worked with hammer and he had a slideshow and he used this image in it. And I didn't know it was William Kentridge and I loved the image and I downloaded it into my photos. And when it came time to, you know, you have to have a cover, I remembered it. And I, I actually did a Google reverse search thing and it was William Kentridge and I thought, oh God. You know? And, but the, the profane halo was designed by Jeff Clark who made that design for that book. And, I, I guess it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a case where um, just the writer uh, picking the visual and, you know, that that came together in that way, you know, because of you're like a dual artist, you're a painter and a writer. So, but I'd like to choose uh, other artists for my covers. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. As you, you don't do. want want everyone to have your own art on your cover. No, no. I I prefer to be with people in the community of artists, not by myself. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, okay, now <laughs> the the title nopes from the passenger mm -hmm. how did that come to mind had you thought of it and then began the work or did it come to you in the midst i'm i'm guess, guessing i'm asking where where did how come? did the manuscript start okay um it had a lot the book had a lot of journeys it was it was it was started before my uh, selected poems came out so there was it was you know the next next world the, the pandemic had not happened yet and anyway I did the selected and then I went back and only a couple of the poems from that original manuscript the next next world made it into this book because they just weren't um, germane anymore and the whole book took on a completely different trajectory the messenger was written 
was was the first poem that was written from the book, but I never wanted the book to be called the messenger because there isn't a message and that that would be so didactic and bizarre. So I, then I created the passenger to, you know, undercut the notion of the messenger and then um, a sense of a kind of loss of control the the people that were in this world that i was envisioning had not had very little agency in their world they were more like passengers in a you know a train rack yeah that was the word passive comes up with passenger mm -hmm. it's you're not you you're not the driver yeah 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 and the i I began. I I liked that about the book, about, or the the world a lot. That you know, um, that was not a bad thing for human beings to lose. Was a sense that we were um, in control of our own fates. Um, if this is you know what it has brought us, so um, I have completely forgotten the original question and it probably digressed all over the place great. but it's great okay I, i'm glad, glad you as much as you want um and notes oh the what, notes what, yeah one thinks of a more casual the less formal writing more vernacular because mm -hmm. it's notes mm -hmm. yeah 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 i became intrigued by the idea that signals were coming through you know that there were notes that were left but they were you couldn't really understand them and they were um different alignments and you know things that were coming towards us but but not things that we could understand because we were in a different world and i would that what happens in the book is there's a there are there's ancient figures like there's the homeric and the in the passenger poem, there's Saint Perpetua, and then there's also this hurtling of, of a futuristic space, and so the the whole space time continuum, which seems to be something that we're still very much in. Um, uh, I be, I became aware of it, and so then that was part of the notes. The other thing that's going on with the notes are are musical notes um, because I thought a lot. I listened for some reason. I listened a lot to Mozart when I was writing this book, mm. and um, the instrument I thought the most about when writing was the piano, um, and in particular the 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 quality that the piano has if you press on one, one key and how that sound can extend and attenuate into for a very long time until we as humans can no longer hear it. And so that duration of time I was interested in, I have no idea how that actually entered the book, but um, I thought about that. It's, it's, it's there. Mm -hmm. It entered the book. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so there are six sections. Uh, you number them with Roman numerals, which is not a casual thing to do mm -hmm. in this time. Mm -hmm. And probably you had to think about that. Um, I think that it was very practical, oh, really. Okay. The it, it, in terms of putting the book together, one the Saint Perpetua has a lot of aerated pages, is how I think of them. There, there's a lot of white space, and there's um, time uh, going on that is just really op more open than it was in other poems. And so she had to have her own section. And because she had her own section, that threw everything else off balance. So it was almost like the um, 
that poem started to have a conversation with some of the other poems, like how to have a future memory. And that poem became more uh, formally engaged in an experiment like St. Perpetua did. So anyway, to answer your question, the, the section numbers became Roman numerals. And then there's another section called um, uh, the possibility of joy in the face of death, which is a quote from Bataille. And those were, those are not, because those, that is a long, a poem that's in sequence and it was with uh, numeric, you know, one, two, three, not Roman numerals. So yeah. it was, yeah. that, that was, it was kind of practical in that way. I see. But I, yeah, it's kind of a formal thing to do, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I wondered if you, were working on all the sections at once, or once do you finish one section? Do you start it over working on the other? Another? No, the, it was the the, the, I, the book found an order, you know, and I knew that that was the order, but I couldn't. There was a. I was really happy when I figured out the section breaks. Because, and that's where the sound came became important to me because then it was like okay boom bada, boom <laughs> that was that was could go on and it could hold the book and all the directions that it went because of those pauses of durational sound that found a way to be by having a section break and it uh, yeah. That made me real happy once I figured that out. Great. Because it it was it was yeah. So there's an arc. There's an arc. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Mm -hmm. Um for each session, there's a tone, a feel, but the arc goes through oh, God. words. Yeah. And feeling. Um I'd like to zero in on one poem now, now that really blew me away. Um, how it was no longer the country that was divided. I had to think about that for a spell, mm -hmm. how it was, how it was no longer, how it was no longer the country, how it was no longer the country that was divided. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. The was, was, in the title, to, to was, uh, made a turn. I, I see sometimes, uh, I see letters that aren't there. There is W-A-S, and I see W-A-R. So I um, see that the word is more. Hmm. It comes up before you say it or write it mm -hmm. um um and uh it's it, the first line is it was the order and the words it it was the order and their words so the fifth line goes from was was to war that's where you should say to teach my daughter something new, your grandfather's war helmet, I say. Mm -hmm. Looking at the pages, that's why I was, I wanted to sh show the pages. It's like a textile, it's a bunch of words and blank spaces, mm -hmm. it's like fabric. You might think that it, at first, it's a conceptual poem. First, the idea, then the text following the procedure. Mm -hmm. But 
on reading a nanosecond of it, you know it's not. It's a lyric poem. As Peter Gizzi says in the, an interview, I am interested in a lyric of reality, mm -hmm. a contemporary lyric, not traditional metrical rhyming, mm -hmm. but it's a song nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then on the next page, the last time the line you write, unlock and in re river cane, the lyric, do you know that patois? Mm -hmm. The poem is unfolding as I'm reading it. Tell us about how you make a poem that unfolds well, the reader is reading it. Mm -hmm. And um, tell more about your uh, sense of the, the lyric. Okay. Um, thank you for that really great reading. Well, I, 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 I love what love you said it. about was, the word was and war. And, um, and also the title, how it was no longer, and then no longer, it was no longer only the country. And then that was it's divided. Yeah. The, the, the sense of, of, of great loss of what, how, what we had before, even if we hated it, um, it was, it was none. But my sense of the lyric and the sense of, of something unfolding, uh, that uh, my hope is that that comes from the way that I compose that I don't know where I'm going. And so the hope is that the reader will um, come along. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a hard, it's a very good question. And I would like to, I really, really love the idea of, of a weave and um, because that's very much what goes on. It, and at the same time, there's a there's a story in that poem. There's a narrative, and there's a relationship between a mother and a daughter, and they're driving, and they don't they have a they want to get somewhere, but they don't know where to go, and uh, and then death comes in the car, and who will death choose and so the the relation between them, the two of them, and and in the world, uh, and then song, yeah, I I would say that my sense of the lyric is very much tied to song and so uh, it goes music right and back to where it started. Yeah, yeah. and if, if I could be another I, kind of artist, I would love to be a singer. And a painter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, um, on the same page as you wrote the lyric, uh, St. Perpetua comes up. St. Perpetua invented the diary in person. And then Skipping across section two, how to have a future memory, we come to three, St. Perpetua, the one poem, mm -hmm. long poem, Perpetua's Diary. And um, you've already told us about her diary, mm -hmm. but maybe you could take us a little more through what you uh, found in the diary that made it into the poem. The poem, yeah. Okay. Um, the diary, I was just, the, I think I found 
I did not know about Saint Perpetua, nor did I know about her diary. And I, I think it was in reading um, the Il I read um, all of the Iliad again when I was writing this book, and I was so I was in that time period, and I and I found her, and I was I was intrigued about what was true and what was not, in, because we while we do have this text, we have it in both Latin and in Greek. Uh, we have no idea about, you know, what, if Tertullian is actually the person who picks it up and um, uh, he was, a, he claimed to be an eyewitness, but their uh, scholars are, you know, they say, we, we don't know, you know, what, what, how this, how we even have this particular text. Um, and I was intrigued by the, I, I had never done that before where I had taken a source material like that, and then um, you know turned it into a poem, and so I sat with it a long time and um, lifted direct quotes from her. That it was her writing. I was very attracted to the idea that this this is the this is the that this particular it's considered one of the earliest Christian texts that we have, and it's also it is it is proof that women wrote in this time period. So that was very intriguing to me. And I wanted to use her actual words rather than, you know, paraphrasing anything. And there's a moment in the poem and it's when she quits writing and it's because she's been killed. Um, and I just have one page that says, I don't want to read any further because we know the words aren't hers. You know, we don't know who wrote them necessarily. It could be Tertullian, we don't really know. But we do know that whoever wrote the rest of the of the diary is not Saint Perpetua. Um, and the other thing that's very intriguing about the text is that we we know that she disobeyed her father because he's he comes to her, he's begging her to uh, not to tell, you know, just tell them you're not a Christian. They won't kill you <laughs> and she won't do it. She's, 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 she's no, I'm a, I'm, I am a Christian and I you know I'm going to, to do this. And that was very unusual uh, for the time period for a Roman daughter to disobey her father in that way. Um, and then there's a, kind of small, short scene in the diary in which he accepts uh, her decision and walks away weeping uh, with that. So anyway, it was just a very moving uh, text and um, I, I wanted it in the book, you know? Yeah. I, I just fell in love with her in some ways and um, that she was an ancient, she was, she was an ancient voice coming in, you know, and that we could have that, that I could, that I could, I wanted her in the book for that, that sense of a space time con continuum thing. But it's not like I was real aware of the, I wasn't real aware of the motifs of the book until the book was pretty much finished. And then you have to sit down and look at what you've done. And People want copy. <laughs> you know, they, they want explanations. Where is it? They yeah. wanted that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I have a poem involving the same Saint Perpetua and her diary. Yeah, that's maybe it's time, time to read it. It would be wonderful. Everyone, loves, I, that, that would be fantastic. I love that you have a Saint Perpetua poem. Amazing. Okay, I'm going to read my poem. <laughs> Can everyone hear Norma? Does she need to? Everyone now get 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 up really close to the mic. Maybe. Yeah. A little bit more volume. I can't hold it. I have. To move it. Thanks. 
Okay. Oh, that's different. Well, oh. What book is this poem from? Oh, it's from Contrafact. Contra it was uh, 1995, I think. 96. Untitled from Nostalgia. That's a book I never wrote, but it's from that book. <laughs> Quote I awoke still chewing something undefinable and sweet, Perpetua. I woke still chewing. That's one's reason to know something in. Undefinable, anything, emotion, for instance, and sweet. Our hearing, what people live, will, and imagine for each other. At the end of that word, get ready for it. I turn to a ladder, my my dear, with sharp weapon attached to its sides. The lateral emotion inflicting difference between riding and driving her imagination of others' lives before in time, a satin waist stand is the image of women with eyes closed. The only tender image of when do we eat and what book was that? Every bead counts. He has a sh scratch on his right cheek. She an abrasion above the corner of her mouth. She wears treasure A, a lovely touch. Where does the first personal plural begin? That all experience takes place overboard. What is document? The I'm telling you form. L letters from the bridge, apples, barely telling about over to tongues, one for me, observe in the singing, her work or her tree, the book of intention. We know it as the name of a book, a writing, a position, a philosophical legacy, although it was named after a person. His son deals in battle. Now read it. So I go from Perpetua to Aristotle, um, Nicomachean ethics at the end. So that's, that's but I have one more poem that has a line from your work in in this uh, the end of this poem. Well, I'll read that too, and then we'll have a conversation okay. with people. Um, Rip tide. There's a shadow over the city. The light as usual, framing and erasing. Just say you dream fires each night, smoothing each collapsing page from the throat. Talking is a near in a series of measures in the high desert. The perfect life in a series of measured gestures an invitation to see the world from a bridge that burns in the next night. In the next night is from your book. <laughs> yeah. oh, I have a, I have a question. Do y'all have any questions? Do you want to talk just a little bit? Or I have a question for Norma about the document that you the you, the word document and how um, 
what what drew you to Perpetua for that poem and working with it as a document because that's you know not easy to do. I I, I think. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, document. I think I use a lot of documents in my work. I just take from them and have a conversation with them a lot. Mm -hmm. That's it. And um, how I came to perpetua. I, uh, I don't know. Um, it was just that time. It was in the early 90s. And maybe the book came out then, mm -hmm. the diary. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. But um, we were all thinking about women and writing and the ancient world because they, there were no women writers there, but they were. So it was started to come out, and we were voraciously reading. Okay. Yeah, there's. I think there are descriptions of Perpetua with, you know, a notebook and pen and you know plumes whatever instruments she used and that they were common at the time or that so that that was one of the things that was um, kind of mind-blowing about it. it's two, 203 CE you know okay the word the word The, the the question was the contemporary uses of the word perpetua uh, and where we find those. And the, the first thing that comes to my mind, it's actually in my poem, is the font perpetua, which is a very attractive font that uh, uh, is usually smaller than the other fonts. But the other thing, I did a little bit of research and there was a, there's a pencil that is called a perpetua pencil. And it is made out of rubber, recycled rubber that would, from old tires that would have otherwise gone into landfill and uh, was you know, crushed to such an extent that it was made into a very thin pencil. And I was going to order one. And I, now I'm, I've, I had forgotten all about it. And now, because they sound as, very interesting to have, but there's that. Thank you, Dominic. <laughs> Jillian, it was so Jillian, it was so uh, interesting to hear you talking about rereading the Iliad while you were making that work. I wonder if you could just say more about what that experience was like, and maybe the two of you could talk about um, these parallel instances of work that, in one sense, seems so far away, but it's right there with you mm -hmm. while you're moving in and towards your own work. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, I think that's what's so marvelous about it. the Greeks is, is that the, 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 the candidness of the style is so immediate, no matter what ancient Greek, you know, writer you're reading. And with Homer, that's certainly the case. And the, the battle scenes in the Iliad are so vivid and, um, so incredibly violent and you know we're we have a very violent culture so um it wasn't it was just um i in many ways a reminder that I, I, we, we seem to be so cut off from a lot of history and um to think that oh you know that we have mass shootings and well yes we've been killing each other for a very long time and so the Iliad is 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 so violent from the very beginning all the way through um that it's um 
a reminder of, I mean, of that for me that 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 was you know commonplace and that we've always been barbarous horrible human beings <laughs> norma says same <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the classics are the classics for a good reason, right? They're amazing pieces of art. And uh, I love reading Homer because he's so, he's just, it's as though someone had walked into the room and that is your contemporary that speaks to you directly in, in this very frank and candid way and portrays things that are extremely visual and vivid i like that about it yeah yeah that i i was not reading homer when i was writing this i was more, more likely reading about um Lebanon and Palestine, e Egypt, and the and North Africa of uh, Carthage. I was interested in the pre-Christian Carthage and how um, they, they were really vicious. Mm -hmm killing their children, mm -hmm. um, a lot of that. Um, so I was not particular, particularly reading the Iliad at that time. I was more uh, probably reading the Aeneid. Uh, Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perpetua, both Perpetua and Felicitas were North African, and so that's that is exactly the world that they came out of. Carthage was Carthage. I believe we may have come to the end. <laughs> no. Yes, Alex has a question. <laughs> I don't remember, do you? So long ago. It was a long yeah. time. Yeah. When you live in the Bay Area. You made all the poets, and you become friends. And I, I when I was translating Misha, um, I was petrified, and because I really didn't have any business doing it because I was not fluent in French. And I and I showed it. I said, Norma, <laughs> you know, would you look at this? Because I was just fooling around. I didn't. I, there was um, four hundred men in the crowd. On the on the cross, I learned about and wanted immediate. I wanted to read it, so I translate. I was just, you know, I didn't have any intention of publishing it, but then it occurred to me that maybe I could, and so I met with Norma to um, to read over it. And Norma was great because she would just point <laughs> at areas that I needed to go back to, you know, not and never. She would never tell me what what anything was. And I remember one time Norma said, the verb tense. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the most, you know, direct input. But but she also said, you should, you know, go translate. She gave me permission. She didn't say, she was not shocked that I was doing this. And she was just, no. And I think we should translate something together, which we still haven't done. And maybe we can do that. So we, yeah, we'll do that. Our next project. <laughs> Well, it's really been, thank you so much for you. being here and 
Um, it's very meaningful. And one of the things I've always admired about your work is the way you have the minute that you have, you'll have a continual thing going on and then it, it will go into another direction as soon as it gets too continuous. And yet it seems inevitable that it goes the way that it goes. And that's a very um, lovely thing to, it's, it's, it's always seemed an act of generosity to me, to, to the reader, to say, look, we can go this way now. And we don't have to have this perceive, this, this received way of reading, of existing, of perceiving. And I think that, I mean, Norma, you've been a great influence for so many people. In the in how that your work has done that over many decades and continues. I have I have a, a coda that I want to talk about. It will just be a minute. Um, in section six, you have a poem called "Thank You for the Afterlight." For God. And I constellate afterlight with afterlife, afterthought, afterward, after dark. And uh, the same thing is that we, was happening with another poem that I read in it. But, um, and, and on page 90, you say, where Stinap thinks it saw a spirit. So you go from the brain to a spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then it takes you right back to the beginning uh, where there's the first ep epigraph George Krakow, tell me, how long have we been dead? So I just wanted to say that it goes around and around, and then you start reading the book again. And fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Norma. Thank you, everyone here at City Lives and so many really sweet friends and poets I love have shown up. And thank you, Peter, for hosting us. And thank you, everybody online who came that we can't see. Thank you so much. I'm one happy person right now. It's time for a drink and something to eat, maybe. <laughs> <laughs>